1 Samuel chapter 22, familiar passage of scripture to all of you all. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Duham. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. I want you to drop down to chapter 23. And then they told David saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah and the, they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keala and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle, smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keala. Amen. The Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. In this passage of scripture, I was, I, I was doing a series uh, last summer on strongholds. And I began to talk, look at the strongholds that uh, David wound up living in for a while in his life. And also the stronghold of, uh, he encountered later that the children of Israel had been dealing with for hundreds of years, uh, the stronghold that was in the town called Jebus, um, that for years and years from the time of Joshua, uh, when the children of Israel to go in and take the land, uh, they could not drive out the inhabitants of Jebus. And the Bible says that the Jebusites were with them even to that day. Uh, they were a mocking spirit. They, they mocked the people of God and said, you can't come up here and take us. They said, if you come up, we, we won't even send our military people out. We'll send blind folks out and they'll beat you. And that had happened for over a period of centuries that they had been uh, held uh, in mock by the enemy in a stronghold. But the first thing that David did when he became the king was to take the stronghold of Jebus and turn it into Jerusalem. Amen. But David had a lot of experience with strongholds because we find back here um, in, in chapter 22 that uh, he finds himself in a difficult situation. He had done so many great exploits in, in taking down the Philistine Go Goliath and, and delivering the people of God. And he had been elevated to become, uh, before he was just a musician and, and an armor bearer, but now he was a commander in chief of the military forces. His family doing well, he was doing well, behaving himself wisely, the Bible says. Knew how to go out and come in. It wasn't his fault that the women start singing songs about him. <laughs> what could he do, you know, <laughs> just doing his thing. Uh, but but, but, but the, he came in and, of course, he got Saul jealous and je Saul tried to kill him at the dinner table. And he realized, I, I need to leave town. It is crazy that you look at the life of David, the ups and downs of him getting to this place. Uh, with an anointing on his life and yet having to go up and down and out and back and, and, and have to prove himself in different spheres even though there's an anointing on him. I, I think there's some anointed people in here and you, you've been through some ups and downs and some lefts and some rights and, and, and wondering how why it's taking so long to get to where you're supposed to get. Amen. But God has a way. I mean, how, he has a way of taking us through stuff and cause us to begin to appreciate how we got to the place that we got to. David finds himself at this chapter 22. He's had to leave town in the middle of the night and he's escaped with barely the shirt on his back. 
And he gets out to a place and he has nothing. He, he has no reserves, he has no food, he has no suitcase. He has no place to live. A guy that has been living at the top of society for a while that now finds himself homeless. Homeless. Can you say homeless? Uh, some of us may have found places in our life where we were about to be evicted or uh, we didn't know where we would go, but we call a relative, we go somewhere. But David has nowhere that he can go. It's so messed up that his family has to show up because they know if, if the king is after David that he's going to kill them too. So he is a, a newly homeless man who's gone from the palace to a cave. And before he can formulate in his mind, how do I survive as a cave dweller? How do I survive living in a cave? Amen. His parents and his family show up and say, we need to live with you. And he said, well, there's some extra space back there in the corner of the cave. Y'all can make yourself home at home back there. And, and by the way, David, we do need something to eat. And David is like, yeah, that's a, that's a good, I was trying to work on that myself. I was trying to figure out what I was going to eat. Come on. And while he's trying to figure it out, the Bible says that all of a sudden, he, he, he wakes up and, and, and there's a whole bunch of men outside the cave. Four hundred of them. 400 men outside the cave. Now, I want to I paint a picture for you because as you read the, the, the text as it goes on, you realize these men didn't show up by themselves. They were married and they had children. So there's at least 800, maybe 1,200, maybe 1,500, 1,600 people that show up to David's cave. This man who has been anointed of God, I mean, he was there when he was chosen above all the fellows in the family. And he was there when they, they poured the anointing oil on his head. They didn't anoint him to be a shepherd. They didn't anoint him to be an armor bearer. They didn't anoint him to be a singer. He was already anointed. They anointed him to be the king. He's the king. He, he knows he's the king. He knows he's walking under that anointing. And yet he's going through all these changes and now the king finds himself homeless. I came to tell you that it doesn't matter what your circumstances look like today. It doesn't matter where you live, how, how you live, what your bank account says, amen, what your wardrobe says, come on, what the title on your job says, hallelujah, if there's an anointing on you, you've got to know there's anointing on you. You've got to know where God has called you to go to, you've got to know who you are in God, and you've got to be able to look in the mirror in the middle of the cave and say, I am anointed to be the king. I am somebody in God. There is something God is about to do with me. You can't judge me by what you see right now in this cave am I talking to somebody here that knows hallelujah that the state of your bank account is not where God is taking you hallelujah that you have been in, called into the kingdom for such a time as this hallelujah and even though it doesn't look like it to your neighbor and to your cousin and maybe to your mama and your daddy when you look in the mirror you know God you called me God you appointed me God you got a destiny for my life and I'm not going to be dismayed by what I see in my bank account. I know who I am in God. Look at somebody and say, I know who I am. And if you don't know who you are, amen, today is a good day to ask God, who am I? What have you called me to do? I don't want to leave this church today without knowing, God, what the call is that's on my life. 